Josh. Hi, and welcome to another edition of Newsmakers. I'm Jerry Roberts. It is Friday, March 25th. We are joined today by Ryan P. Cruz, staff writer for The Independent, Josh Molina, noted barbecue writer, and, and uh, Nick Welsh, the dean of uh, Santa Barbara Journalism. Yeah, Josh, I noticed Also noted that. barbecue eater. Well, too. we, we yeah. know Jerry's huh. mad at me. Oh, huh. my. I'm, I'm the barbecue writer. Nick's the dean. <laughs> This is going to be a great show, Jerry. How many weeks? How many weeks in a row can you find a new barbecue place? Okay, um, <laughs> the world is not so good. The slog uh, continues in the uh, murderous invasion of Ukraine. Um, one of America's major political parties has turned into an authoritarian uh, cult, following a crazy guy, and everybody is kind of done with COVID as we approach one million deaths. And there's been a big shift in messaging from government, both locally and federally, which is live with it. Uh, we've sort of gone from a public health crisis to you're on your own. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this uh, new variant. But I find myself in total agreement with Supervisor Doss Williams, who says we shouldn't conclude things are over. All right, let's go to the local stuff. Uh, State Street, Josh. Um, the new State Street Improvement Committee wants $800,000 for yet another consultant with your hero, Megan Harmon, saying it's a meaningful investment, world's greatest spender of other people's money. What's going on there? Well, I'm glad you're actually leading with the top story of the week, this Jerry, even though it happens to be mine. I, I appreciate you acknowledging me. Um, so basically the city of Santa Barbara, they went before the council a few months ago, back in November, said, we're going to hire this State Street uh, master planner consultant. They threw out the number of about $200,000 internally, two hundred dollars to 400000 for somebody to kind of pull all of these different agendas together, all of the infrastructure, the aesthetics, and say, hey, we're going to help you come up with a plan. Remember Dave Davis said, we're going to need to work through the end of 2023. Well, uh, they held a meeting with potential bidders, the city did, and they're all like, you can't get any of this stuff for this budget. This is like a $1.4 million endeavor. So you're going to have to cut back or pay more. So then they rehuddled, they re, uh, redid the RFP, they trimmed some things, and they said, don't go over $800,000, okay? And that's what they did. And so now everyone's got a budget and everyone's like, okay, we know we can rack it up to at least $800,000. So the RFP uh, closed and now they're gonna be reviewing these RFPs. It still has to go back to the council. What's interesting, Randy Rouse did not know, Megan Harmon did not know, uh, the people that I reached out to for the story, it's her downtown district, Randy's the mayor. But she, they didn't she, know. she sounded like she, she supported the 800. Well, after I filled her in, yeah, you know, she sort of felt as though, hey, this is a big deal. We need to do this. Uh, Dave Davis is behind it. And, you know, they're close allies politically. Uh, Randy didn't know about it. And so he's going to take it up when it comes back to the council. But this has gone up quite a bit in terms of cost. The council must approve it. And it's just part of what they do. I talked to Dave Davis for the story. He's like, this is like the general plan. This is once in a lifetime. You know, we're going to do this. We're going to set it up. We have to do it right. We can't do it on the cheap. But I think to your average person, you're just sort of like, why does this take so long and why is this so expensive? Count me as an average person. Um, meanwhile, well, you Ryan, are a Giants fan, Jerry, so <laughs> that might be even a little yeah, high. Oh, I forgot to mention baseball's back. Uh, Ryan, uh, you, you were writing about State Street also this week. And yeah. um, what, what jumped out to me is uh, the Aloha Fun Center, yeah. which is supposed to save us all. Uh, uh, at Paseo Nuevo is nowhere to be seen and uh, not returning your calls. They, they're they they're pretty hard to find. And, and you know, you go you go to the site and they have that, that fun looking window coming soon. You go to their website. Uh, they have a lot of info coming soon. They even have prices on laser tag and, and skating, but you there's no sign of, of life there. And also what was kind of interesting is they had a, a location that just opened up in Emeryville and that one shut down a couple of weeks after it opened. Um, so I asked in the email if, if, if that would hamper them opening up any earlier here, 
but I haven't, I haven't heard anything back so far. All right, Nick, you know, my instinct on this consultant thing is to be the cranky uh, uh, taxpayer and say, what, what's with 800,000? But the fact that Dave Davis, uh, he, he carries a lot of credibility. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? And, and it's, so I'm kind of inclined to, to, to go with his judgment. What's your thought on Dave? Yeah, you know, the fact that Dave <clears throat> is involved, he, for people that don't know, he was sort of the Wizard of Oz Grand Poobah at right, the City Hall for many years as the head of community development um, and <clears throat> planning. He was here for, you know, the last, you know, he, he was, you know, at the helm when they brought Paseo and Rainbow down. He'd been involved in many of the more transformational changes that have occurred on State Street and, and when planning seemed to work. Um, and is seen as sort of a Renaissance man, visionary. And so, yeah, people are willing to uh, defer to him, uh, even if it does have high sticker shock right now. Henry, Henry. Um, he's like Alfred Hitchcock, you know, he has to make a, a cameo in every... Henry, it's, it's okay, she lives here. Um, Henry doesn't agree with that 800,000. <laughs> All right. Yeah, anyway, uh, okay. And then uh, the, real quick on the underpass, uh, Jeff Shelton's design. Uh, Ryan, talk about that a little bit. And um, is that a done deal? Yeah, it, it got approved. I mean, it, it, it's got approved through Historic Landmarks Commission. So which which is, you know, the most kind of one of the hardest things to get through when you're trying to do something that's kind of a little different. But I think Jeff Shelton has built uh, enough of a reputation here to he does have that Spanish colonial revival style, even though it's a little bit different than your traditional, you know, uh, just just adobe or or white walls with the red tiles. He he does his own little thing. And I, I really am a big fan of of his architecture, his buildings he has. His, I think they really add something unique that's kind of new, has a funky colonial flavor. You know, it's, it's something different. It kind of has a little bit of an indigenous flavor, the way that the things are kind of tiled in the colors and kind of the motifs. But I, I'm a fan of it. I know that it's definitely going to be a new look, but I mean, if you go under that underpass now, there's it's nothing special. It's, it's concrete. Um, it's actually kind of dingy and smells of urine and yeah, exactly. Dang. And and you know, to to connect State Street to the Funk Zone, which are both really nice places. You right now you have to walk under that, you know, dingy yeah. underpass. And jo uh, jo really good. Uh, Josh, did you check with Sheila Lodge uh, on her view of the uh, Jeff Shelton uh, whimsical underpass? I don't think the whimsical underpass and the Tuscan pillars in any way block her view of the ocean. So my guess is she's probably okay with it. All right, uh, Mayor Lodge, if you're not, give us a call. Uh, <laughs> it's that... important to know that every, every place, anything that gets built in San Barbara is at the entrance of San Barbara. Wherever you are, it's the entrance. <laughs> Of Santa Barbara. That's the entryway. <laughs> and this is another entryway. The there's, a lot, there's a lot of eight a lot of gateways here. That's why that's why Nick is the dean. Okay. <laughs> um before we leave the city council, real quick, the, the we got these four maps uh for the redistricting of uh city council districts, um, which I guess are gonna be voted on, on March 30th, yeah. one way or yeah. the other. Uh, you know, they, there's not a lot of changes. It doesn't look. It looks like the incumbent relief act because yeah. everybody gets to stay in their um, district. Yeah, yeah. There's none of the fireworks that we've seen in some of the other um, redistricting processes. Well, your piece on uh, on uh, Carpinteria uh, redistricting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In Carpinteria, you, you see they they had a uh, hundreds of, of community maps coming in here. You know, this is this isn't the first we've we've done the redistricting process. I think it was 2015. Um, and so this is kind of an update compared to the census or to update with the census. So I think since there's no outliers or it doesn't look like anybody's trying to force their map that's much different, I think this has kind of been a smooth transition. And like you said, uh, one of the ones that they choose is going to be not that much different. It's just a couple blocks with uh, Alejandro's district one and, and uh, Oscar's Oscar, district. Oscar, yeah, yeah. And it was interesting that uh, the only council member who was really on top of it looked like it looked to be Kristen Snedden. Yeah, yeah, Kristen. She's been in on the meetings and she's been paying attention. And um, you know, she's it. 
some of the maps drew her out of the district. So she was kind of forced to pay attention and some of the maps would gave her each East, East Beach and she, she, she told me East Beach belongs on the East, East side and she didn't really want that. And same with Oak Park, they tried, some of the maps kind of drew uh, District 4 to include Oak Park and she said she'd never knocked on those doors. And so she kind of wanted to make sure Alejandra and Oscar, since their districts would be the most uh, affected since it's about the Latino voting population that they're okay. She, she with. was happy with Coast Village Road though. Is that still yeah, in her yeah. district miraculously? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think- That I makes think, a lot of sense. I think anybody would be happy. I think Eric Friedman would be happy to, if he was drawn I mean, to Coast Village Road. I mean, she paid attention because she was going to get, she was going to lose uh, Oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was smart. Nick, your um, uh, uh, poodle this week, uh, is a be, has kind of a shaggy dog story about different color band aids and how much they cost and where they're sold or not sold uh, as a way of uh, easing into the uh, uh, controversial hearing uh, of uh, uh, future Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown. Um, and there's a lot of resonance, you know, with what's going on in the school district now. Josh, you. Uh, interviewed Wendy Sims Moten. I know June did as well uh, after that that incident. But uh, the school board, uh, to uh, try to tie this all together, has decided to hire James Joyce, our old friend James Joyce, coffee with a black guy, former um, mayoral uh, candidate, to uh, help uh, to do something. I'm not sure what. Nick, do you think that's a good move uh, for them? Uh, you have to do something, and it's, it's one of those things you have to take seriously, but you can't just come down and only punish. You have to have a, a, a broader discussion and dialogue, and having a dialogue about race is about impossible. Uh, and I think uh, James Joyce III has been doing this professionally now for, I don't know, seven, eight years where you know, he goes into the various workplaces and really tries to get people to have a conversation and not just say what they're supposed to say, but what they really think and sort of move off that dime and create a space where such a conversation can happen. And I would say, when you think about what's going on with students in the schools and what they've been through and all the pent up energy and toxicity and anger, you know, you need somebody who has some talent and some who can come in and not just wag a finger and say, this is what you should say, but who actually can engage in conversation. So I thought that was a smart move. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and James James definitely has a, a way to, to <clears throat> talk about race, but not have it be, he's, I mean, Coffee with a Black Guy, every, every, every episode is kind of has a, a racial, you know, component to it, but he's definitely has a good way to, to bring it a discussion and kind of let people have their experiences. And I think right now it's really important to let people kind of vent. You see, I mean, I, if you pay attention to social media on these kind of comments, you see a lot of people have gone through the same type of things that didn't have a chance to speak out maybe 10, 20 years ago growing up in elementary schools here. And I think now having the chance to, for people to come to these meetings and, you know, have their voices heard and have James kind of moderate the discussion or kind of participate in that, that, that sounds really good. Josh, when well, Jerry, you, I don't, when I don't you know talk, if you're going to call on Jerry. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to call on me for this discussion. I was going to just ask you a question anyway. about Wendy Sims Moten, uh, who you interviewed. Um, I, I, I have a question though. Um, I, I, I don't know if the school district. I should know, uh, but was there a public RFP? Who else was interested? Why did they go with him? Um, just kind of like off the top of my head, I'm thinking Hilly and Justice SB would they also do this work and why are they not included in the conversation? Um, I'm sure James will do a fine job, but I just like, so was I don't know. Was that, was that a, was, just, just an- uh, why, why, why him when there's a lot of people who do the work? Uh, no, that, it was that was an executive process. call by Hilda Maldonado or it didn't go before the school board, right? Well, I didn't see them vote on it. It might've been on consent. Yeah, it was a consent, it was a consent thing and they <laughs> approved the contract. Um, but I mean, it, my, I my only thing question, is yeah. if you've had healing justice SB and they've been consistently driving the agenda and making everyone uncomfortable for two years now, purposely uncomfortable. I don't say that in a negative way. I mean, forcing people to think about issues that they've not 
had to think about before, and they've been driving the agenda on social change. I'm sort of curious as to why this was not more of a thing like, hey, we're going to be reaching out to the schools. We're going to having this community conversation. Who's interested? Maybe I'm missing something here, but seems to me like they would be likely candidates. Josh, well. I, I think told it, you it 20 seems, years ago, always look at the consent calendar. <laughs> it seems it seems like it, it was kind of a from my feel, it, it seems like they wanted to get something done quickly. And maybe to do that would have been especially now a long back and forth with who would have the jurisdiction. And then you don't want you. You definitely don't want any sort of uh, in, uh, fighting of, of who's in charge of this or or not. Um, so that, that might be the case, but it might also just be they wanted something, a response right away that they can point to and say, hey, we're doing something. Um, and yeah, yeah I, would I would love to see more people involved and more action towards this and more discussion towards this. Well, yeah, before, before we leave this, uh, I, Josh, uh, you're, I do recommend your interview with uh, Wendy Sims and Moten on your, on your podcast, uh, really emphasizing you know, that there's a difference between talking about racism in schools and talking about anti-Black racism. Um, and, you know, again, the lack of transparency from the school board, you know, they have this report about how many incidents there have been, but we really don't know anything about them. Um, except, I guess, uh, that they were Latino kids who got on top of a Black kid to reenact George Floyd um we, we don't even know that formally like that we don't formally, know that yeah formally. that's just what we've heard but I, say, I mean yeah. uh do you think james is is gonna do anything is he the right guy shouldn't the school board be putting out more information rather than less about what's going on I, here i i don't know you know obviously i know james james is very likable and uh you know he's, he's a good guy he does this work so it's not about james it's more about everything I talk about when it comes to government and processes. If you're going to hire someone to come in to do this work, why is this not a bigger conversation so everybody knows about it? Are there not people from outside of Santa Barbara who come in and be completely free of what's going on? Um, I don't know. Maybe they have these conversations and we just don't know about them, but I know that it's just curious. It's just sort of interesting. I know that some board members are very close with James. I don't know what the deal is, but I do know that if I were a member of Healing Justice and I'd wonder like, wait a minute, why why am I not? Maybe they support it. I don't know. It's, it's yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah, Nick, I mean, I agree with Josh on the, on the crummy process, but I don't know. James just seems like the perfect choice. I mean, he's here. This is what he does. He knows the yeah. community. I, I would definitely like, Step, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I would like to see more people be involved also, but I definitely would not want to, you know, like, I don't think it, it is a sort of who it has to be one or the other and they're choosing one and they're leaving somebody out. I really, because there's already a lot of that in these meetings and that really distracts from what people want to be and want the changes to happen and, and kind of distract from this, oh, who's involved, who's not involved. And yes, that is really important and, and they should be involved as much as possible. And, but I, I really think, just kind of getting things out there and in, in the open right now is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, and I, I will say this at the risk of offending James, who does a great job, but I mean, that's a difference between corporate work. There's a difference between nonprofit work and there's a difference in deep, deep work having to do with complex uh, issues around race and discrimination and anti-blackness in Santa Barbara Unified School District. So I'm sure he's qualified to, to do that. They hired him, but these are just journalistic questions I have, which is part of our job when we think about writing about these things. What about hey, the hey, other alternatives? Hey, Nick, Nick I, I, I mean, it seems a little bit of a parallel to the Dave Davis uh, situation where just James has this stature uh, and, and this, you know, track record around these issues. What do you think? He does, and, and you know, again, you know, it, what he does with coffee with a black guy may or may not translate to, uh, you know, 13, 14 year old dudes, you know, or, or people in the high school. Um, you know, there is a different uh, population, takes a different skill set. 
hopefully he's got it. Hopefully yeah. somebody has it. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave it there. Uh, uh, Nick reminds us that we are in the middle of a thousand year drought uh, this, this, this week, which by the way, uh, the, the late lamented capital letters column pointed out uh, five years ago, be that as it may. Um, Gary, you were talking about almonds long before anyone else was talking about I, almonds. Uh, I remember I'm, that. I'm not bitter, but uh, we learned this week that uh, we're getting 5% of our uh, uh, alleged hey. allotment from the state water project. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a one, two punch. So we were notified that you know, this January, I think it was uh, the driest in recorded history in California. Uh, and the winter has been very dry and you know, there isn't a single reservoir in the state which is up at, at normal levels, whatever normal means. Uh, and, you know, in, in California, 400,000 acres of farmland are laying fallow because they don't have water. Uh, and so the people of the Department of Water Resources announced, <clears throat> you, you know, you're going to get 5% of what you're allotted. And in city or the county of Santa Barbara, the state water project <clears throat> on paper is 45,000 acre feet a year. In reality, it's about <clears throat> 25,000. Uh, what we'll get this year is 2,200. So it's a <clears throat> significant uh, drop out of the bucket that we won't be getting. Yeah. And <clears throat> for cities like Santa Barbara, which has a desal plant, <clears throat> Excuse me. I think we're okay, but for other water agencies, it's going to be much more of a pinch. The other thing that's sort of looming in the backdrop is that Governor Gavin Newsom earlier had said, you know what, I want everybody to reduce their water consumption by 15%. I think where that got us was about a six and a half percent reduction. And he is playing with the idea very seriously of making that 15% mandatory. And for water districts in the South Coast, like Santa Barbara, where we've already dropped 20, 25 percent uh, since 2013, and it didn't really go back up, that's going to be a huge, huge I, impact. I mean, I sound like a broken record on this, but give me <clears throat> a break. I mean, yeah, 25 percent. Oh, let's do another 15 percent. 80 percent of the water is going to agriculture. And if you want to make a dent, then you have to have agriculture conserve and stop growing almonds, um, which require, as you know, uh, Ryan, uh, six gallons of water per almond. Um, is there any, yeah. is there, Josh, is there any conversation on the city council about any of this? Or are we headed for, you know, 30% conservation or, or more? You know, I think in the last uh, water report, like Nick said, Santa Barbara is in a fairly good position because of its uh, diversity of water sources and the fact that it has the desal plant. Santa Barbara people tend to conserve water uh, in really high numbers. So I think the city is in a good spot, but there's nothing extra that they're talking about other than the uh oh, Josh is water uh -oh. reports that they do. And when, when development comes up, it's usually like new development does not contribute to the drought because these fixtures are so water efficient that they're actually better than what was there before. So right. what that's worth. Um, and then uh, finally, the Nick, you uh, report on the uh, point in time count and the homeless uh, situation that there are 65 more people on the street than there were the last time. And I think it was you who once calculated that a total of $42 million is being spent on homeless uh, programs and services between nonprofits and government locally. Uh, doesn't seem very well spent. Well, Terry, you, you opened up a can of whoop ass there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have those numbers for you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those situations you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And we've been trying to do it both ways uh, and succeeding. Uh, they are, you know, we have about 1,900 people on the, uh, 
are now counted as homeless. Uh, and that's and now on the South Coast, not counting. No, that's all. the whole county. Oh, no, that's no. So it's. I went from 19, uh, 1897 to 1962. But the real sort of striking number is that the two thirds of these people are living on the streets or in their cars. They're not living in a shelter. Uh, and the gap between those who are in shelters and those who are uh, not is growing. And part of that is just, I think, a reflection of COVID because shelters can't, accommodate as many people as they have in the past. The last point in time, time count was two years ago, and we didn't have so big then. So, uh, you know, they claim that they've gotten about a thousand people housed uh, in the last two years that were, you know, homeless. Uh, and that's, if, if that number is accurate, that's a pretty big number. And it's one of those numbers that you don't necessarily see with your eyes. It's it, it's what you don't see that counts, I guess. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's, Tasha, it's, it's very Tasha, expensive. You're you're always hobnobbing with the commercial real estate guys. Um, uh, have they all stopped? All the all the State Street uh, property owners that they, they've pretty much stopped complaining about the homeless problem, have they? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. No, they've, they've not stopped complaining. Um, I think it's a very big concern that they have um, for all the reasons we talked about on the show, but um, I have not heard them say that the problem has gotten any better. They're still looking for solutions from City Hall. One of the solutions Richard Birdie had for that property and everybody who lives in the area, I won't mention any names, Jerry, you know, came out and said that was a bad idea. So I think that it's still a long-term conversation about what, what to do with the homelessness of downtown. Yeah, well, of course, the concern was about wildfire uh, on that. All right. But we're about uh, well, just this, I mean, you know, it is important to say that we are sort of moving and, and doing things and doing different things. So we have a homeless place that's going to be under construction over by Veracruz Park. There'll be homeless housing. And um, over on the 1000 block of Santa Barbara Street, there's going to be a new uh, tiny home village, I think 33 homes, uh, right in the middle of downtown Santa Barbara, you know, a county owned parking lot. So, uh, that's the sort of housing you can build a lot cheaper than trying to build real housing. And that is a three year program. So yeah. we are making steps. All right. We'll leave it on a positive note because I'm such a positive guy. Um, Ryan, you, you, you've gotten a city hall beat. You're, you're running around the track miles ahead of Josh on most of the stories there. What's what what's coming up on council? <laughs> we got a couple things next week. We got a, a nine million dollar contract for the central library renovations, which is a three part project. So that should be pretty interesting. And then uh, we got an, an ordinance that's going through the ordinance committee. That's going to make it a little bit easier for developers to get the permits um, instead of if they have pre existing violations. Um, I think now that this this ordinance will change it so they can kind of promise to get it fixed without having to get it first fixed before they get the permits. So they can kind of say, we'll, we'll get it fixed and and not really have to be have it enforced. So that could be streamlined streamlines the process for people that want to permit and get get things built. But you know that it's it's definitely developers are getting helped with that one. All right. Josh, who's who's gonna be uh, next on the podcast? The Wendy Sims Moten one is still up. I, I recommend it to everyone. Um, uh, well, well, Jerry, I'm going to steal from your audience and I'm going to pull a conservative for my show and I'm going to be interviewing uh, John Davies, who uh, we're going to be talking oh, about conservatism in Santa Barbara and Mike Stoker's campaign. And, you know, my whole thing is why, why do conservatives organize so poorly and uh, how do they shift the balance in terms of gaining more sort of political weight going forward um, and get his thoughts on the Democratic Party and sort of, you know, how they've changed over the last few years and a variety of other topics. So oh, good. That sounds like a that sounds yeah. like a, a good one. And next, speaking of Mike Stoker, um, you uh, in on this very show last week compared him to a cicada. Um, <laughs> have you, did, you, did you hear from Mike on that at all? I haven't heard words. Oh, okay. 
And he's saving it all up for, for when he sees you. Um, I, I want to... He, wanna... he did say, I mean, uh, you know, he, he just won't... Everybody will believe Mike has no chance, but, you know, he does a good job impersonating someone who thinks he has a great one. And he says, you know, Greg Hart, everybody thinks he's so hot and he's wonderful, but Greg Hart has never run a campaign against anybody in his whole life. His whole political career, he's never had a significant opponent. Me, on the other hand, he says, I've had Lois Caps, I've had Hannah Beth Jackson, I've had Doc Williams. <laughs> and although I lost all of them, I outperformed when I, I did better than I should have done. So, so, so he's that. he's putting money in Vegas on the over. He got to the final four. <laughs> he's, he's... What, what's interesting is is with this election is I'm, I'm wondering to see if a lot of the, the conservatives are claiming this is going to be the biggest re uh, Republican year ever. Um, it kind of seems like when we're getting closer that I don't know if that's actually going to come with the numbers. And so when the day that it comes out, it might be that this wave has kind of receded in. And especially in California, we saw this Larry Elder, that, that rally was huge. That was so many people came for the, that rally. And that was more than I thought would come and um, didn't really see that at the Stoker event. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering to see if that wave is still riding high or if it's kind of coming back down. Yeah, I think nationally, you're absolutely right. The Republicans are going to stomp the Democrats, take over the Congress and probably the Senate. Um, I just don't see it in California. I, there's not, I mean, there's no... Uh, initiative on the ballot that would draw it out. Uh, nobody's got a serious challenge to Gavin Newsom. I don't, to me, the only interesting uh, political stuff in Santa Barbara is going to be the school board race when they, when we kind of sort out who's in what district and who's on first. Uh, I think that might be interesting. And, you know, this, this challenge to Susan Salcedo, the county, uh, uh, education czar is, I mean, an opportunity to air a bunch of issues that Republicans would like to, but uh, I'm not seeing that. Nick, I want to go back to uh, the cover story, not this week, but last on uh, Ukraine and help for Ukraine and what people are doing and what people can do. Uh, can we just close with the, just a real quick summary of if people are looking to help? Uh, in some way, and this helpless feeling of this murderous dictator. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I got a notice today that um, uh, I'm a blank on the, on the precise name of the dance troupe that performed at the uh, rally at the courthouse. They've raised $50,000 they're sending over. Um, there are people within the Ukrainian community who are doing fundraising for weapons or for ammunition or for bulletproof vests. Uh, there are people working behind the scenes doing fundraising. Uh, and I don't know how they're getting the money over there. I think direct relief, last I heard, what was it? I can't remember, it was like 500,000, more than that. Uh, and then um, Shelter Box, those are two sort of international organizations that have a network and you can be pretty sure that if you give them money, it will get into some goods that have a better than average chance of actually getting into Ukraine. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, okay. Well, that's going to do it. Thanks to Nick Welsh, Josh Molina, and Ryan P. Cruz. Uh, uh, we will see you next time on Newsmakers. <laughs>